uh, we've developed over the last years courses in the areas that are listed there. Uh, the flags around the edge are the countries that participate in this virtual university, and the flags down the middle are the countries in which we held those uh, workshops, which I'm sure you all recognize instantly, so I won't explain what they are. What's been interesting is as we develop these courses, which are intended to be shared and adapted between 30 plus states scattered around the world, we had to address the question of, of recognition. So we worked with the um, South African Qualifications Authority. We got people together, this is what this picture is, uh, from the uh, qualifications authorities of the small states. And they worked together to develop a transnational qualification framework with great help from the South Africans who were very expert in this area. And I think what surprised us is that collaborations of bigger states have not managed to come up with this kind of transnational qualifications framework. But the small states, I think because they were less hung up on their own frameworks, were able to evolve something which they could all agree on. A transnational qualifications framework is a bit like the electric socket problem. Everyone would like a common socket around the world to provide it in my socket. And that's where this sort of discussion breaks down. This, I think it's fair to say, is going uh, extremely well. As you can see, these small states are scattered all over the world, the Pacific, the Caribbean, uh, the landlocked states in Africa, such as Swaziland and Lesotho, and um, Seychelles and Mauritius in the big uh, oval in the middle there, plus uh, Cyprus and Malta, who participate somewhat in this in this interesting project, which I'm proud to say is run by the small states themselves with a management committee uh, led by uh, Emma Cruz Vai from Sama and John Lesperance, who's on my staff, who facilitates the progress from a base in Vancouver. So that's for our education sector. The second sector, learning and livelihoods and health, is aimed at the much more informal, basic areas of learning that are vital also for development. Um, <clears throat> the general area of skills development, by which we don't mean conventional technical and vocational education and training in schools, but informal skills development, particularly for people who are trying to get a bit of a leg up in the informal economy. So it's taking them from where they are, which is often with very poor literacy, to something that enables them to earn more money. It's as, it's as simple as that. Alison is working generally in that area. Um, my colleague, um, Dr. Bala, has made a great success of this in the specific area of farming. Um, and I won't go into the whole model here, but one of the most interesting things he's done recently is to work with the University of British Columbia to, to link a mobile phone system to a learning management system so that we can send out audio messages to farmers on a regular basis with a quiz at the end of it and use that as a way of um, helping them to learn as they are earning their livelihoods. Uh, this is in its infancy, but at the moment there are some 6,000 women in Tamil Nadu, India who earn their livelihoods by rearing goats who receive every day about four very short one, two minute audio messages about how to rear and feed their goats better with a little quiz at the end to say, okay, you know, if the goat is, is, has this problem, what do you do about it and so on. And this, this has had quite a dramatic impact. Um, not long ago, a veterinary surgeon did an assessment of the health of the goats that were in the program, if you like, and those that were not and found that the goats being reared by the women who are in this program of lifelong learning were notably more healthy, they had more kids, they were weighed more, they were more valuable and so on and so forth. So this really is a program that is helping people improve their livelihoods. Another program which is based primarily on community radio or community media generally is called Healthy Communities and the idea there is to try and put the community back into community radio. For many years, governments were very scared of community radio because they felt it would be a tool for the political opposition. 
But events like the tsunami in Sri Lanka and India have led them to see this is actually quite a useful tool for communities to work together. So um, there's now a, a, a much more relaxed attitude to this. India is in the process of creating some 40 or allowing the creation of some 4,000 community radio stations and we're very much involved in trying to help that process but to, to ensure that they really are expressions of the community and that the community then uses them for useful development oriented tasks in particular in our case anything to do with health maternal health child health hiv aids and the increasingly severe problem of diabetes that we're finding around the commonwealth Finally, um, Trudy Van Vitt, coming from South Africa, is the person charged with integrating e-learning wherever appropriate. There is an insatiable demand for uh, training in e-learning, which Trudy is trying to handle in a number of ways. Um, we have made a very big commitment to open educational resources. You'll be aware, I think, of the sort of movement which was given of it big boost by MIT in the late 90s when they put their lecturers' course notes on the web. Um, the British Open University then put much more self-learning materials on the web and they're being downloaded at a ferocious rate. And our own virtual university for small states is in, in a way a sort of third generation of that because here the teachers are working together internationally to create open educational resources which they can all use. So we might want to come back to the whole issue of open educational resources. Another project that started in the Commonwealth of Learning is a thing called Wiki Educator, which was the brainchild of a colleague called Wayne McIntosh, who now has his own open education foundation in New Zealand and continues to uh, develop that. Um, but that's been a very interesting development, which now has many tens of thousands of people using it. Um, we ourselves, well, I'll come back to the whole question of Wiki. So this is Wiki Educator. Um, and the thing about Wiki Educator is everything in it has to be completely open. You cannot put copyrighted material or proprietary software on Wiki Educator, which is both an advantage and a problem. Um, the final area of our work, which I should mention, um, is we have a little unit in New Delhi called the Commonwealth Educational Media Centre for Asia, run by a very bright guy called um, Ramamurthy Sridhar. And over the last year, um, they decided that they needed to get the price of laptops down. So they've now got the price of a laptop down to $65 for an educational computing device which as we speak is being used in one of the atolls in the Maldives where there's only one school with 30 children and they can't afford the normal complement of teachers so what they've done is to take this $65 computer paid for I'm pleased to say by an Australian university thought this was an interesting thing to invest in and the curriculum for the children is loaded on this computer and we'll see what uh, happens and I might come back to that uh, just at the end. Um, much of what I've been saying while I've been in Hong Kong is based on this book I published earlier this year, which is essentially about uh, two things. It's about the open schooling challenge, the challenge of the, what I call the secondary surge, these millions of children who are coming out of primary school in the developing world and have nowhere to go, and what we, what we do about it. So part of the book is about that, and um, the other half of the book is about the teacher education challenge, the 10 million teachers we're short of that I mentioned um, earlier. In the book, um, in terms of, this is more to do with the open schooling, what can we do about the secondary school children issue. Um, there are people who claim that you can solve this problem with information technology. So in the book I researched three projects which um, were based in the developing world 
and which people claim were partly an answer to this major educational challenge. Um, I'm going to talk about the first two this afternoon in my lecture, so rather than scoop myself, I thought I'd just talk a bit now about the one that I'm not going to refer to <coughs> this afternoon uh, because of shortage of time, and that is the uh, Holding the Wall project in India, of which I'm sure you've heard because it is one of the great interesting experiments in um, the use of computers for children, not in schools, because that's the point. Uh, this is a brainchild of a guy called Sagata Mitra, who as soon as he put a computer, cemented it into the wall of a Delhi slum, and found that within two weeks the kids were doing all their normal computer operations of dragging and dropping and finding the music and so on, um, he realized he had a tiger by the tail. So he started a research program which goes on based on this, um, on this phenomenon, which I think is, is, is very interesting and has also 